Hey, Brody, thanks for being with me today, brother. Hey, right, glad to be here. It's been, it seems like it's been a long time coming, but uh, we made it happen. All it took was a, uh, a global epidemic, and here we are. There you go. Not like we don't have plenty of time on our hands right now. Right? That's right. That's well, right. Dude, I tell you what, my in-laws are former Alabama alumni, and they are going to be flipping out when they know that uh, <laughs> I got you on here and we're talking. So, yeah, roll tight. Gotta, huh? gotta love them Bammers. That's right. That's it, man. We just actually interviewed, uh, do you know Corey Miller? He was the, he played a uh, linebacker for the Giants many years ago. His son is now going to Alabama. Uh, oh, what was his son's name? I can't even remember now. But he's a, he's a South Carolina guy. Went and played with the Giants. put me on the spot here. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> he, he, he played with like LT and all the big time linebackers back in the day of the Giants. Really? It's really cool story, and and uh, his son's now at Alabama. And I, I, he's a big Gamecock, South Carolina, and I'm going to interview him. He's got this big Alabama bright red shirt. I was like, bro, what's going on with that? <laughs> so, I get that. My mother went. To, my mother went to Auburn, so uh, you know she went to Auburn, married a guy that played at Alabama, but was still kind of a house divided. You know, we're, we've never been like just just crazy fanatics about it, even growing up, but. Uh, my mother, when it's amazing when your children go to school somewhere, how all of a sudden it becomes your school. Cause she's like the biggest Alabama fan ever. Uh, and it's almost like she doesn't even remember that she went to Auburn, but I, I always joke around and say, when people are like, well, you know, your mom went to Auburn. I'm like, yeah, she's a missionary. You know, she's going down there. <laughs> she's to God to people. But, uh, it is, it's neat as parents how we all of a sudden we just kind of, we go with where our kids are. That was that was before God got a hold of her and she That's became right. an Alabama yeah. Alabama fan. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. what it was. So, brother, tell me, like, uh, give me your story, man. The background, where you were born, Ooh. that type of deal. Well, if you uh, depend on how long we got here and how long we're wanting to go, um, I can tell you when I was 11 years old, um, I walked into my parents' bedroom and I said, "I'm gonna play in the NFL." And versus telling me anything besides like, hey, maybe you should go make your first football team or even try out for the JV football team. Uh, I'd never played one down of organized football. So at that point, <laughs> they should, I was hoping they would maybe now that I'm going, maybe they should have done that. But uh, to their credit and to my parents, they always uh, were always just, hey, man, shoot for the moon. Worst case scenario, we'll end up in the stars. And that day, I'm ashamed to say, football became my God. It's all I chased. It's all I wanted. It's all I thought about. You know, I did the good Southern boy thing where you get saved when you're six and you get baptized when you're nine and you understand what's going on. But, you know, and you rededicate your life when you're 15 at church camp because some pretty girl did it as well. You know, I mean, it's just you do the good Southern boy things. Uh, but, you know, if God's not first on your list, he's not on your list. And uh, when 11 years old and I make that proclamation, uh, it's amazing how the enemy uses good things, you know, and that, that was a good thing to go chase this, this dream. Uh, but it's amazing how we use those good things. And all of a sudden, God just started falling, falling and falling and falling on my list until, you know, I get to a place where you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at Alabama and getting to play in front of hundreds of thousands of people and getting to be on Sports Illustrated covers and uh, all sorts of, of, of cool things. But there was just this emptiness inside of just going, man, what, what, what is it? I mean, it's, it's just this emptiness. And I was trying to fill it, uh, this empty hole with uh, this God-sized hole with this, this God called football. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, everything that came with it as well. Uh, and it's amazing how you, you just start believing everything that comes with it. And to this day, I, I still don't know why my wife married me. Uh, she's, she is an amazing, uh, godly woman that uh, is the godliest woman that I know and is truly my greatest earthly treasure. But she married me, and maybe I was just uh, good at covering up, you know, what really was my God and what was my focus. Uh, but we had been married for about a year and I'm competing for this job that I've been honestly fighting for since I was 11 years old. And I, I, if, if you could see me in person, you'd realize, man, that guy's six to 200 pounds. He probably doesn't need to be playing the NFL and you'd probably be right. 
you know, I just tell people I was always just stupid enough to keep getting up. You know, I've had 11 surgeries, three broken vertebras, dislocated jaws, punctured lungs, ruptured spleens, you name it. I've had it. But I was finally in this position where I was, I was competing for this job. And I'm in my first year of marriage. And I go, I, I basically, I bookended my day in darkness. You know, I'd wake up in the morning and it'd be dark and I'd make sure I was at the facility and I was studying and I was working out and I wanted to be there before anybody else got there. That way they know it was important to me and I'd make sure I'd stay late and make sure that my coaches knew that it was important to me and uh, I was prepared for the next day. And then I'd come home and this first year of marriage, you know, marriage bliss. I, I, I say that jokingly because uh, it was awesome and it was marriage bliss, but you know, I'd come home and my wife, <laughs> She, she didn't work and we lived in this you know far away city 12 hours from anybody that cared anything about anything that we had to say and she would watch rachel ray every day so i'd walk i'd come in at night every night to some new meal that she had made and if the problem with rachel ray is she doesn't teach you how to cook for two you know you cook for eight <laughs> to ten and we'd have all this leftover food but we get through and we have all this food and uh, then we'd kind of just go through you know, the conversation of the day, then we'd get in bed and all of a sudden I'd open my, my playbook back up because I needed to know what my protection was, what my hots were, what my read was, what the line's job was, uh, what the other team was doing, what to do against what front and what blitz. And I'd sit there and ultimately I'm sitting there and I'm holding my God. And I look over and my wife is sitting there and she's holding hers and she's sitting there, she's reading her Bible. And little did I know she had been doing it every night, but I was so just fixed on what it was that was important to me at the time. And I, I tell people, not everybody gets this, this picture that I had of I'm holding my God and she's holding hers. And I'm just sitting there and I'm going, man, I'm looking back and forth before finally I just, I, I shut the book and I set it to the side and I grabbed my wife's hand. And I said, baby, I'm, I'm sorry. I failed you as a husband. I, I, I hadn't been the man you thought you were marrying. But if you'll have me, I'll spend the rest of my life trying to become that man. If she was sitting next to me right now, she'd be like, yeah, he has a lot of days. He misses the mark. But I also, you know, people always ask, what's your Jesus story? And I tell them that I, I, I checked all the boxes early on. But my relationship with God began that night. That's when the relationship began of how do, how do I become this man? that you created me to be? How do I become this man that walks in purpose? How do I become this man that spiritually leads my wife and that one day is gonna be a father uh, to two future little men? And little did I know that that was gonna be the moment that also spurred getting to lead a ministry with you know 170 kids and you know 16 kids in college and all these different opportunities. Uh, but it's just, as we talked earlier, it's amazing how God uses us doofuses uh, because he, because people look at us and go, God has to be in that because there's no <laughs> way he could have pulled it off. With it. <laughs> so there's, there's, the introduction, there's the introduction to my story. Amen, dude. What a testimony. I tell you, I can only imagine, uh, you know, having the success and, and the fame and everything that comes along with it from Alabama to then Kansas city, right? Kansas city chiefs and, mm -hmm. Eric, just that whole story and and as young people and you see it all the time especially these young athletes getting so caught up in it so distracted mm -hmm. by the things that that really don't matter but we don't know any yep. different we're kind of immature and you know we're just living the life right mm -hmm. was there was there a time in all of that that were there times that god kept showing up like to remind you hey bro i'm still here or was it you were just so far into it, you weren't paying attention to anything? That's a great question. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in moments, like big believer in moments. Like um, I, I call it why moments, you know, those moments that point us towards our purpose. And, and you know, I, I get an opportunity to share with people a lot of, you know, uh, they're looking for purpose. They're looking for calling. They're looking for passion. They're looking for all these things. And, I just go, you know, you're looking to the, to the heavens like they're just going to fall out of the sky. And all of a sudden you just get to grab which one it is that you want. And it's amazing how God uses moments in your, through your entire life 
to try and point back to him, to try to point you in a direction, to try to get your attention, to try to also begin to, you know, just like David, begin to start shaping you for the war that you're going to have one day. So you're not just walking in there as some meek, mild little boy that got lucky and threw a slingshot, but man, you're walking through that with conviction going, no, I'm prepared for this because I have uh, been a part of it. Sorry. Can you still see me? No. no, no, no. My phone was Is ringing. your wife calling you? <laughs> no, my phone was ringing. Somebody was calling in, but uh, you know, where, where David walks in and he was prepared for that because he had been, groomed for it his entire life the difference was david was returning that moment those teaching lessons and he was giving them back to the giver so he could step in from being a shepherd into being a king one day that's purpose that's calling so many things that god's trying to use in our lives unfortunately we use them for ourselves we're like oh i'm deserving of that or oh that was that was a nugget from god thank you for the blessing where he's really going, no, I'm trying to give you something to point you in the direction I'm asking you to go. And, you know, I, I did, it's amazing how you look back on life now and you go, oh, man, he was using that moment. Oh, man, he was using that moment. My, honestly, probably the reason I'm talking to you right now uh, was that first moment in life that I had no clue at the time uh, what it was. But as I began going, all right, God, you're asking more of me. It's amazing how he pointed me back to a moment that happened when I was five years old. You know, it doesn't have to be like it was last week. It's amazing how these memories, I mean, I've been hitting the head a lot. You know, I'll probably forget half the things we say in this. I'm joking, everybody. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> when I was five years old, uh, was that first moment for me. And it honestly has shaped my why for why I'm sitting here and even talking on the phone with you right now. Uh, but I was five years old and I stand in front of the administration building uh, with my dad and this old beat up truck pulled up and this guy got out and he's smoking a cigarette and he throws it down. He stomps it out and he walks up and I got my arm wrapped around my dad's leg. He goes, you the man in charge? And my dad goes, man, I reckon. He said, well, he said, uh, I got a new girlfriend. She told me I got to pick. He said, it's either her or my boys. He said, so if it's all right with you, he said, I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave my boys my three boys with you. And uh, so out they got. And 11 year old got out, said no more fighting, no more getting beat up, no more going hungry. He said, this sounds pretty good to me. He said, I'm in. And he went inside, he started playing basketball with other boys and um, just, he went about life. Well, the 10 year old got out and he was like, I told y'all he was gonna leave us. And he took off running, took our social workers three hours to catch him, bring him back, let him know everything was going to be okay. And it was such a picture at the front end of just going how different people respond to moments and how that is now. It's just such a teaching thing now. But my, my moment, my why, got out next. And it was a six-year-old little boy. And he got out and he realized what was going on. And he jumped up and he put his arms around his daddy's neck. He said, no, he said, you can't leave me the same way mama did. And I watched my dad reach around he peeled the little boy's hands off and he pulled him into his chest and dad got in the truck and he drove off. They never saw him again until after they graduated high school. And little did I know that that little boy was going to grow up to be my best friend. We we're going to play baseball together. We we're going to rodeo together. He was going to be in my wedding. And it's amazing how that moment that at that point, all I thought was, man, I, I gained another friend was going to be a moment. But it's amazing how God keeps using that same moment and that same, that same vessel. Uh, because that, that, same, that same young man who is now a grown, grown man called me about five years ago. And I was sitting in my office. He said, what you doing, man? I said, I'm sitting at the office. What do you mean? He said, I got a new, I'm about to get married. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> like we hadn't had this conversation, buddy. And uh, I was like, well, man, tell me about her. So he goes on and telling me about this girl and how awesome that she is. And at the end of the conversation, uh, he tells me something that um, it, it was a moment, but at the same point in time, it, it's a perfect picture of what God does in our ministry in so many different ways. It, it was just this incredible moment. He said, Brody, 27 years ago, he said, my dad pulled into a stranger's driveway. And he said, and I met this big, tall man that made me four promises that we still make to every single one of our kids that we love you. We don't want anything in return. Just give us an opportunity to earn your love back. We'll never lie to you. And this is the one every kid remembers because 
we, we have followed that with, if we ever lie to you, we don't work here. We're fired on the spot. Doesn't matter who it is. So they're, they're, they're constantly on that one. Uh, but then uh, we say, we'll stick with you until you're grown. You know, and that's where we, we send our kids to college and we have, you know, a family reunion every year where 600 plus of our past residents and their families come back. We're, we want to be a place for you to forever call home. But number four is there's boundaries. Uh, and it, but at some point in time, those boundaries are going to give way to relationship. and They're not even going to matter because what you had to do is going to become what you want to do. And he said, but I, I met this man. He made me these promises. And he said, but um, then I walked inside. He said, and I met my real mom. And he said, Mom Duke's going to sit at the front row of my wedding because she was my mom and she didn't have to be. He said, but then I met my real dad. And he said, he's going to stand next to me as my best man because he stood in the gap when he didn't have to. He said, but how cool is it? At my lowest point, God was already preparing me for the life that I'm about to live. I said, what do you mean, man? He said, the girl I'm marrying has a seven-year-old daughter that I now get to be dad to. He said, how cool is it? And my lowest point, God already had this sovereign plan in place. He said, I know you're busy. He said, I got to run. And it's amazing how God uses these moments and these nuggets uh, that you think were for one reason. And you think that they're pain or you think that they're elation or you think that, you know, it's encouragement or, you know what, it might be a discouraging moment. It might be a peak. It might be a valley. But God's using these all throughout your life. And, you know, I got too many moments that I can sit here and name you. But it's amazing how just that one young man, we've got to share four, five different moments with that have helped shape both of our lives. And what's cool is about before this, all this happened, maybe six weeks ago, uh, he and his wife came in and uh, said, we just wanted to tell you this, you know, in person. I said, well, what is it? They're like, our, our little girl who's now is 12. You know, they, they, she looked at us and she goes, why do y'all pray different than me? And they started getting to have this conversation of, uh, of uh, this union with the father and this conversation with, with uh, the, the God that wants to have a relationship. Well, how do I have a relationship? And they got to walk through how to lead her to Christ. And they said, we just wanted to come and tell you in person. And you know what? It's amazing those moments that we try to use for ourselves. God's really going, no, I'm trying to give you opportunity to where we can have this, this horizontal relationship that you can earn a seat at a child's table that then all of a sudden is going to point to a vertical relationship with a heavenly father at some point in time. But you know what? It took him going and living that out and earning a seat at that table for him to point her to where that is. Now he's getting to shepherd her through this new spiritual journey that she's walking through. So anyway, this it's, it's a pretty cool story and I can sit here and bore you with a million other ones, but uh, Dude, that was the first one. I love it, man. So before we jump into what you're doing now and everything you're involved with, Let's talk about your dad for a minute. Mm -hmm. How did he influence your life as a man? <laughs> Where do we start? Uh, you know, I, I had an incredible father, um, you know, an incredible father that was influencing me in, in so many ways. Uh, and, you know, was incredibly busy, like a lot of fathers are. I mean, my dad used to speak. 250, 300 times a year. Anybody that would open the doors, uh, he would go speak. So I got a lot of one-on-one -on -one time because I would go with him to these speaking engagements. And, you know, I'd get to, I'd get to hear him speak, but it wasn't, I, I can't even really remember at a young age, you know, what he even was talking about. I just, I can remember the dinners. I can remember uh, the breakfasts. I can remember the car rides and the fun that we had. I, I can re and it's, it's all about investment. It's all about just, it's, it's, you know, I, we talk a lot and I might get into this later or whatever it might be. But, uh, one of the things us is as men in general, uh, but also, um, especially children, boys, if you will, you know, one, we want to know we're loved. Obviously we all, we all want to know we loved, uh, you know, we want to know that we're capable of great things. John Eldridge does a great job talking about, you know, that, that, that element of it. So I, I won't even dive into that, but it's so true. Like, so true. Like we want to be seen that we're capable of great things, but you know, what we've learned and, uh, just from obviously our life, but also 2000 children that are our, been our greatest teachers is especially our boys. They want time. They want time invested in them that, hey, 
you think that I'm awesome enough and you think that I'm worthy enough that you have time for me. You know, I got, I got taught this lesson. Um, I got taught this lesson myself, uh, not too long ago. And it took me back to my father because he was always so good about investing time. But you know what, during that time when he was investing, there also wasn't this thing called cell phones, and laptops and iPads and Wi-Fi and just this, just this world at our fingertips at any time. So when we were investing in time and we were investing in time, but now, you know, this is, uh, can be a message, but it also goes back to my father's teachings of how important that time is because I've been trying to get in touch with a, a potential supporter uh, for weeks and he finally called me back and I answer the phone and we sit there and we talk for 45 minutes just about the ranch and about what's going on and, and you know, future projects and would love to get him up and he is planning the time he's going to fly in, fly out. And I get off the phone after 45 minutes, I'm on cloud nine. I'm like, man, the opportunity has presented itself. And it's amazing how you can go from this mountaintop to this valley so quick because out of the back, my little boy looks and he goes, hey, dad, you got time for me now? He had patiently been sitting in the back for 45 minutes waiting for that moment. And it was just, it was a humbling moment, but it also took me straight back. Why, why was my dad so intentional about that time? That's 45 minutes, I'll never get with my son again. And it was all over a phone call that I very easily could have called him back. And it's a prior, you know, prioritizing what's, what's urgent and what's important. And, you know, we say that at the ranch all the time, like, Hey, we'll never forego the important for the urgent, for the urgent ever. Like the important is always there. Uh, and, you know, I think as, as fathers, my dad did a great job of teaching that to me that um, the world can stop. Uh, I, 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 even when I was in college and I needed him, uh, another great lesson for me now <clears throat> is he always took my phone call. It didn't matter who he was with. It didn't matter who he was talking to it. I mean, I've literally, I've called him and he's been the governor's office and it's just, he, he was like, no, my time's with you. And, uh, so he would answer it. It might be, Hey buddy, I'm in this meeting, but if you need me, I'm here. And it's just that intentionality of about uh, making me a priority, making me feel that I'm important, and now translating that down to my sons. Dude, how about being a husband? How did he model what it looked like to be a husband? Well, uh, <laughs> I, I, tell, I tell people all the time, you know, it's, uh, we, we have what we call, it's a college ministry that we call Ascend. And, um, it's the idea of, um, you know, our kids, they're leaving us and they're going out into this world. Right. And, uh, this world can be scary for, for anybody, but it really can be scary for our kids. You know, the, the, the slope is so slippery for our kids because where they, where they've come from, the, the low in which they think, and all it takes is a split second. And instead of, oops, I had one too many drinks. Oops, what in the world happened last night? Like they, they so quickly can go from, I had one too many drinks to, Hey, what's that you're smoking to, Hey, let's share needles. By the way, I'm I like, it, it can happen so quickly because of the, the, the pain they've seen in the past. And so we, we just have a passion for that of our kids coming out and taking the things that they've learned in the home and now going and not only it, plugging it into their own life, but one day they're going to be married. One day they're going to have children. One day they're going to have their own jobs, their own businesses, whatever it might look like. And uh, there was an incident that happened the other day where um, <laughs> I asked them to be on something and they only two of them out of the lots actually showed up and called. And uh, so we had a, we had a strong talk about what that looks like, but I promise I'm getting back to the marriage because it all ties right back to it. And I just said, guys, I realize asking you to be a part 
of our corporate prayer that at every location we have at 835 to 845 every morning, we, we're going to intercede on behalf of our children. We're going to cover our ranches in prayer. We're going to cover our house parents with strength and endurance. Like we're, 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 we're going to cover it all. And we're just going to, every morning, we're going to start our day off in this posture of prayer, this posture of worship. And let me tell you, it might not seem like a big thing, or, but it is. You know, it might seem like a small thing to study for a test. It might seem like a small thing to uh, be late for work. It might seem, but these things, a small thing repeated is not a small thing. You know, we, and it, even as parents, you know, we try to sometimes, we try to live with, for the big moments. That's just our culture. It's our world. You know, we love the big moments. We love winning championships. We love kids graduating. We love uh all these big moments but it's the small moments along the way stacked on top of each other you know it's kind of like chopping the same the same tree in the same spot every single day it's eventually that tree's gonna fall marriage is so much of the same thing you know i think the the we talk about epidemic with coronavirus the epidemic with marriage and the divorce rate in our country is we fall for the illusion of this shiny um, big moments that happen, you know, where it's love is first sight or it's these, uh, uh, these movies that paint and portray, you know, what, what love could be. And what I've learned in my marriage and what I've learned in my relationship with my wife, what I learned from my parents is it's a series of small things, the considerate things that maybe don't even get thanked. Uh, the, you know, the other night, me and my boys trying to give their mom a day off from being a homeschooler, which she'll admit she's not a teacher, but just trying to, Hey, before she gets back in here, let's wash the dishes. Let's have everything done. And it's amazing. There's those little moments, those small things that the world would see and how they are stacked on top of each other and how that provides for a healthy marriage. Uh, and it's, it's just a simple thing. <laughs> Jesus lived it out put others before self. And it's amazing when we do this, these small little things and put others before self over and over and over. Now, when the big moment comes, we're prepared for it and we're ready for it. Uh, but we don't try to live in it because that's, that's not reality. As you said, that's for the movies. <laughs> that isn't for us. And, uh, but you know, the, it's, it's also, we made a, you know, during that season of, honestly, I, and I'd encourage if there are, are any, uh, wives or mothers that are listening to this, um, a godly woman can change the ways of her man without ever uttering a word. My wife did that in my life and the reciprocating, I would say a blessing of that is that we pray together out loud every single day. We worship together. I mean, I, I grew up Southern Baptist, you know, like I, I was told, you don't, you don't put your hands up. You don't worship. You don't open. Like, I mean, I just, that's, and now, man, we, we have a time of worship together every single day. We, I mean, just especially this season that we're in. Oh, it's so cool. I mean, we, you know, we, we've always had our own studies and our own scripture and our own readings and all that. And we'll talk about it at night. And then once a quarter, we'll try and do like some marriage book, uh, you know, I love John Eldridge once again. Love and War is a great book for both of us to read. It's like one one chapter, you're like, see, I told you that was you. And then the next paragraph's like, <laughs> man, I just got set up. Like, just got set up. Uh, Sucker. But, yes, just got set up. But you know what? Now, during this season where we've honestly had to take a step back and we've had to, uh, to kind of take a step back in time in this season of getting to have devotions together. You know, I, I just encourage everybody in your marriage right now, man, what a great, cool opportunity uh, to where maybe the world and our jobs and the demand of what is being asked of us, that this could be a moment that we step back into those small moments and uh, figure out and go ahead and start preparing, uh, you know, for what it's going to look like once it starts back. And my wife and I have already began to prepare for that as well, because we don't want to lose what we got going on right now. Dude, that's really good stuff. It, you know, the fact that it's taken something like this uh, to remind a lot of us of back to the basics of what's really important, mm -hmm. right? What, what we should really be focused on. God, family, friends. I mean, the, you know, it's just, I think it's such a cool time in that. 
and the mm -hmm. people are understanding and realizing, wow, you know what? I really got off track. I really got distracted. I lost sight of what was really important. And so, dude, I, I love it. Now you've got two sons. Got two sons, Sawyer's eight and Luke's six. Ooh, you got a couple yeah. of cowboys there for sure, man. Woo. Now, tell people about the ranch. Tell tell people what you're doing now. Yes. So um, we have a ministry called Big Oak Ranch where we take in orphan, neglected, abused, abandoned kids from ages six to 18. And as I said, we go through college as well. Uh, but, you know, it really started when my dad was 19. He went and worked his summer camp. And he met a little boy from the streets of New Orleans whose mother was a prostitute. And uh, this little boy was the banker and the timekeeper for his mother. Literally go up. Mom, I got the money. The next one's here. And he ran his mom's business. My dad shared with this little boy, how he could become a Christian, how he could change his life. And the boy came back the following summer and shared with him word for word what he had taught him the summer before. And he just realized at that point he'd been given a gift. And what's he going to do with it? And he went on. He had a chance to go play in the NFL. And he went to Coach Brian. And he said, Coach Brian, I want to take the money for pro football and start a home for kids. And Coach Brian said, don't play pro ball unless you're willing to marry it. Tell me more about this ranch you're talking about. And uh, for an hour, he got to share with him this dream, this vision that God had laid on his life of going and helping these children. And uh, he walked out, never looked back, started out in a farmhouse with five boys. And, uh, and since then, uh, it's been 45 years. We've had over 2,000 children uh, that have called Big Oak home. We have a boys ranch in Gadsden that has soon to be 13 homes. And we have a girls ranch in Springville with 10 homes. And what we do, we make it really complicated. Uh, but I'm going to make it really simple for you. We put a godly man and woman in a home and we give them six boys or we give them six girls on top of their own biological children. And we say, show them what God ordained family to look like. Show them what God in intended for a godly man, husband, father. Go walk that out. Go show them what a, a loving uh, wife, a nurturing mother, a godly woman. Go show them what that looks like. Go walk it out on a daily basis. And at some point in time, by living out the hope of the gospel and the hope of Jesus, at some point that they're, they're going to start asking questions, you know, and if there's a story that wraps this up and can explain who we are, uh, I can get into a lot of the, the, the who's and the what's and all the different, but th this is, this is our why. Uh, we talked about why this is our why. And it was really, it was the first girl that I ever got to make the four promises to. And uh, it was, I guess, almost seven years ago at this point in time. And uh, she was 15 years old. And from the time she was five until she was 15, she'd been raped every single day by her father. And that was her life. And uh, when you do what we do, you can tell when a child's been hurt. You, and you can honestly, in a lot of ways, you can tell when you go to speaking engagements, adults that have been hurt and betrayed and um, have never let it go, have never experienced freedom. And uh, I'm sitting there and I'm making this girl the four promises. And um, I just look at her and say, baby, I just want you to know, I speak on behalf of all of us that's in this room. And it'll be me, it'll be house parents, directors, social workers, education people. Everybody's going to have a part in her life. I was like, but I want you to know we love you. And we don't want anything in return. Just give us a chance to earn your love. We'll never lie to you. We'll stick with you till you're grown. There's boundaries. I was like, but I need, I'm going to make you one more. I was like, what's happened to you in the past, it won't ever happen to you again. And you know what? Some kids get it instant. Some, it's like, usually the younger they are, it's like, oh, sweet. Well, here, you take it, since I don't have to carry it anymore. And then I, I get to go be a kid. And usually the older they are, the more uh, you got to chip away to try and actually get to a foundation, begin to start building back up. But all she would say was, I hear you. And for a year and a half, and she pushed and she fought, and she tried to get her house parents to quit. She tried to get me lie where I get fired. She tried anything and everything that she could because she had no reason to believe us. We had to earn a seat at her table. And after a year and a half, she came up to her house dad, the same guy that the first week that she was uh, in the home after dinner went up and said, is this when we go have sex? Because that's the only life that she knew. She went up to that same man a year and a half later, and she goes, I don't know what it is you got. She said, but I want it. And he got to share with her how she could change her life and how, uh, how, how Jesus wants to come in and change her life. And that, that girl's now married. Uh, she has children. She has an amazing job. And most of all, you know, she is, she is walking in freedom. 
because a godly man showed her that what you came from and what you've had an idea in your mind of this is what a man is, is not what a man is. And because of the way he walked that out, she went and married somebody just like him. She had like literally just like him. And, uh, and she had a, a woman that uh, had to reinstill a God-given gift, which is a nurturing spirit that someone, instead of coming along and nurturing that nurturing spirit, it was stripped of her. And a, a house mom showed her, no, baby, it's still in there. We just got to heal it. And then one day you're going to be able to now carry that on to the next generation. And uh, that's, that's what we do at the end of the day. We, we put a godly man and woman in a home. We say, go live life. Go show them the hope of Jesus. And our, our goal is obviously for them to find that freedom and that hope that can only come from him. But then it's, it's to forever break a cycle, to ever change generations. And, uh, you know, 45 years into this, we're getting to see that. We're getting to see three generations removed that have no clue what granddaddy or grandmama ever experienced. And um, so anyway, that's what we do. Uh, it can get a whole lot more complicated. I can tell you we have a college ministry in Birmingham. I can tell you we're self-sustaining uh, in our cattle. We have about uh, 200 head of cattle that we run. And uh, we, so we feed ourselves all of our red meat. We have uh, what we call planting oaks where anybody wants our help. We help them go start uh, children's homes that are uh, take no state, no federal funds throughout the country. And uh, I think we're now in three years that we've been doing that. We have children's homes in 17 different states, and uh, we're serving about 47 different children's homes. And in, in last year alone, 2019, outside of our walls, over 800 children were served. But, you know, what it all goes back to what God asked us to do. And that's, uh, he says, you go take care of my children. And, um, go teach the world how to do it. And that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do. And uh, man, the greatest teacher that there is, is experience. And boy, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I bet you literally have hundreds of stories. Just oh man. Awesome stuff of what God's doing, brother. I, you know what, dude, you are so speaking my language in, in what we're doing with the father effect stuff. It is just such it's such an epidemic. You know, when we first started making the movie, this fatherless, absent father thing was so much bigger an epidemic than I ever imagined. You know, as I began to share my story and everybody I talked to had a story. And, and you're an incredibly blessed dude to have a dad that was such a godly example of what all of us are called to be, right? Because not everybody has that story. When we were making the movie, it was easy to find all the other stories. It was tough to find the great stories, the dads that were just having an eternal impact in a way that a lot of the other dads weren't. Yes. Uh, I'm blessed. Uh, but you know what, here's, here's the awesome part is, uh, we all have a story and we all have our warts and we all have our, our scars. Uh, and you know, my dad's no different and you know what, neither am I. I, I got plenty of things that if I, you brought my wife on here, she would be glad to openly <laughs> fillet me in front of everybody. My sons, once a week, man, I got to sit in front of them and just go, I'm sorry, man. I lost my cool. I didn't speak kindly to you. You know what? The reason you're acting like that to your little brother is because I did that last week. And you know what? I got to sit at your feet. I got to tell you, boy, I am sorry that I let you down. And you know what? At the end of every one of our promise meetings to our children, uh, we, we, one, we just say, Hey, can we pray for you? And we just, we just pray over that child and just in that room at that moment, we want them to hear our heart and our plea to God on their behalf right now, before they know him, they, uh, we, we want them to hear it. And, uh, but after we get out of that prayer, I just look at him and I said, what are we? And it's amazing what the answers you get. <laughs> That's amazing. The answers you get when you go, what are we? But the, the answer you want to get is we're humans. And I'm like, what do humans do? We mess up. I was like, I, I just made you a bunch of promises. I was like, and we're going to do our absolute best to live those out. But we're going to fail you along the way. We're going to mess up. We're going to have bad days. We're going to give you wrong advice. We're going to get you in. We're going to, you're going to be in trouble at times when you shouldn't have been in trouble. But you know what? 
know we're trying to do the best that we possibly can do. We're giving you everything we got. And it's amazing when you pour this out to children, whether it be your own biological children or whether you be uh, 170 that don't belong to you or share your last name or share your same blood. It's amazing how kids, and it's, it's, it's a childlike faith, they want to believe in good. They, they really do. And when we fail them, they want to forgive and they want to move forward because they, once again, they want to believe in good. So don't live with this burden that you feel like you have to live this perfect life because it's not reality. And be honest with me, what are we really teaching our kids if we're trying to say, hey, we're perfect, go live this out so you can see it. I mean, that's, that's just such bad teaching uh, to our children. So, um, you know, but I finished at the end. I'm like, but you know who is? Those promises I just made you, those are God's actually promises to his children. He loves us. He created us. Even when he didn't need us, he wanted us because he wanted a relationship with us. He can't lie to us. It's not his being. I mean, it's not capable of it. We might not always like the truth of it, but it will always be there. He wants to walk this path with us. He wants to stick with us through this entire journey. But there are, there are rules, right? There, there are these boundaries that he places in front of us. But those boundaries are not there to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a God of rules. They're to say, you know what? I just know what happens when you go off. You know, and I'll ask them sometimes, I'm like, did y'all come over a bridge today to go to school? They're like, well, yeah. I'm like, did mom or pop hit the, the guardrails? They're like, no. I'm like, no, if they did, I need to know. Like, I mean, that's bad driving. Man. They're like, no, of course not. I'm like, that's all our rules and our boundaries. And that's all God's are too. Because he knows if we go off that bridge, we go into a raging river. We go into this bottomless canyon that you know what, we might not ever return from. So he wants to set these boundaries in place. But once again, that narrow is path, that path is narrow, but it's amazing when it goes from what we have to do, what we ought to do, to what we want to do. It's amazing those boundaries don't even seem to be the way, be there anymore. Because you can't in your own spirit imagine letting him down because of all that he's done for us. And you know what, one day we hope you feel that same way. Uh, about us and then one day you're gonna um, you're gonna take that on down to the next generation brother you got some good stuff dude <laughs> 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 I, love, I love what you're doing lots, tell, tell lots of teachers yeah exactly <laughs> tell people how they can connect with you like through social media or website or whatever yes uh man we're on instagram we're on twitter we're on um Facebook now would be a, a, a great time uh, to get on any of them because right now we're, we're having to learn how to do things in a totally different way that I think is going to totally reshape so much of our economy and so much of just how we communicate. But uh, we're trying to do uh, just motivational things uh, to, you know, encouraging you as parents to what we're doing with our kids and how we're walking through this, or maybe people can jump off of those, but you know, anything, uh, just uh, big Oak ranch, you look on those and they, they should pull up, but our website is a uh, big oak.org. And there's a million different ways that, uh, you know, for people to get involved, you know, from just prayer to volunteer to obviously we take no state, no federal funds. Uh, and this is one of those seasons, but right now, man, we're just trying to bring value to people and bring value to this situation uh, that really is, I, I believe God's going to use this moment in history to point a nation back to him. And uh, I believe that we needed to be shut down. We needed for our world to slow down, for us to go back to what's really important. And uh, so we're just trying to bring value from the family dynamic of uh, to bring it to that. And uh, so there's plenty of ways to get involved, but uh, Big Oak Ranch is uh, the name of our ministry. Dude. I know you're super busy, man, and I appreciate you taking this time, dude. I've, I've enjoyed it. This is awesome.